Welcome to the Brainy 8 Show, where we talk about all things Salesforce, sharing the coolest features, solutions, and best practices to turn you into a Salesforce rock star. Here's your host, former attorney turned Salesforce consultant and trainer, David Giller. Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Happy Tuesday. I hope you are all doing well. And today I am joined by, hang on one second, I forgot to lower the other browser window and it's buzzing in my ear. Today I am joined by Ezra and Jerry from Own Backup, and we have some really cool stuff to share with you. I'm going to let Ezra and Jerry introduce themselves in a moment, but for those of you who have not uh, who have not joined any of these live shows before. I just want to explain some of the lay of the land of how the show is structured. So as you can see on the bottom of the screen, we've got these three different segments. So the first one is the strategy segment. I often refer to it as sort of like the talking head. And that's where, or talking heads, plural. And that's where today we're going to be focusing on how to deal with some of the file storage limitations limitations that we have in Salesforce. The second segment is what I refer to as the show me section and a segment. And that's where we're going to be focusing on how to do something while looking at the screen. And that's where we're going to be exploring today. We're going to be exploring some of the native options that are available for backing up your Salesforce and some alternate options that you might want to consider for backing up your Salesforce, not only your data, but also your metadata. The last segment is open Q&A, and that's where you guys can ask any Salesforce-related question that you want. It can be focused on anything that we talked about today or anything else that's Salesforce-related. To the extent that we are able to answer the question, we're going to do our best to answer the question. Uh, the, the questions that you've got, and that's really it, for at least for me. Uh, Ezra and Jerry, why don't you introduce yourselves, and then we'll jump into the strategy segment. Yeah, so just want to start off, David, thank you so much for having us today. Um, really appreciate, uh, you know, the longstanding partnership you've had, you know, with us. And, and you know, we, we all know Gina uh, works at Own Backup, who's, uh, you know, a stellar performer in uh, in the Brainy 8 podcast shows. So, um, you know, thank you for having us on. I'm, I've been at Own Backup now for about over two years, um, and I am based living in northern New Jersey. I just found out a uh, five-minute drive from David Geller himself. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> Thank you, Ezra. Jerry, go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, how you doing? Uh, my name is Jerry Reed. I'm a solutions engineer here at Own Backup. I'm actually coming from lovely, sunny Los Angeles, California today. Uh, yeah, so happy to join you. I've been with Own Backup since January. Uh, my previous life, I was actually a lead Salesforce administrator for a large manufacturing company. So, you know, I've dealt with these issues of storage space and other stuff that we're going to get into today firsthand. So, Definitely glad to help out and uh, share some knowledge that we have with you. Awesome. And if you guys are ready, we're going to jump into the first segment, which is the strategy segment. Let's <laughs> All right. Jerry and Ezra, you take it away. Start, you, you, I'll, I'm not shy. You know I'm going to jump in all over the place. But you, you guys take it away. Walk us through some of the challenges with file storage in Salesforce. Yeah. So I, I love your catchy uh, headline here, David, that we started off. Um, <laughs> we, all love, we all love Salesforce. Um, but you know, from, from my experience, and, and I've been working with um, – admin Salesforce admins in the small and medium business segment now for for two years you know what we see constantly is this conversation around you know data storage limits you know you obviously get a certain amount of gig, gigabytes from Salesforce out of the box and uh, it's like how from management coming down to the admins how do we um, solve for this right otherwise our contracts going to continue to increase our Salesforce is going to continue to grow in size um, which is going to affect uh, as well the performance of your environment of, you know, things running smoothly and you want to prevent that. You want to, you know, if you have data from 10 years ago, you know, companies don't want to delete and purge that data because that is not best practice. Um, and in some in industries, it's it's against compliance requirements. 
Um, on the other hand, you're, you know, you're stuck, you're trying to figure out like, where, where do we offload this, this data to? So um, it, it's a very interesting conversation. We've seen different iterations, or I've seen different iterations from people that I speak to, um, especially people who are strapped with smaller budgets of like what, what to do about this problem. Absolutely. And uh, very often I, when I'm working with clients and I see that they have, especially if it's a newer client where I didn't have this conversation with them yet, and I see on any page layout, they have either the legacy notes and attachment section that's on the page layout, or they have the newer files section on the page layout, I will immediately start asking them questions like, hey, are you guys actually using that? Or is it just occupying space and nobody ever pays attention to it? And very often, I the response I will get is, yeah, every once in a while, people are putting different documents associated to a particular deal or a particular company that we're working with, maybe their uh, certificate of incorporation or their insurance paperwork, whatever it might be, uh, or it could even be at the contact level, maybe we need to uh, collect a copy of their driver's license, depending on the industry that they're in. And I will very often turn to the client and say, you really need to think twice about leveraging the native file storage that Salesforce gives. Because like Ezra talked about the data storage, which is absolutely true. I'm not negating any of that. Uh, but what I think is even more problematic, because you can reach the limits pretty quickly, is when it comes to file storage. So we're talking about any attachments. And 99% of the time, the client will turn to me and they'll say, David, it's just a document. It's usually a PDF or a spreadsheet. Give me a break. How big could it possibly be? I mean, don't we? I never looked, but doesn't Salesforce give us some significant limits on how much storage you can have? And the truth is, Salesforce does give quite a bit of storage. But if it's open for anyone to drag and drop any kind of file, let's say it is a driver's license. When someone is taking their mobile phone and snapping a picture of that driver's license, has anyone looked to see what size that file is? The better quality phones, which most of us have, will capture it in very high resolution. And maybe they're sending more than one picture and we're putting all of them into that one contact record for that one driver's license. Now start multiplying that by all of the different contacts that you have in the database that you're collecting just a driver's license for, and then start adding on to that. What if you're also collecting some other documents, and we're thinking of them as documents, from the account or other contacts or about opportunities, but people are actually using their phone and snapping pictures of each page of the document, of the signed contract, whatever it might be, to actually upload into the system. I could take it even further and say there are very legitimate reasons why, depending on the business, you know, what type of industry you're in, if you're installing solar panels on rooftops of different buildings, you want to also take photos. You might also want to have aerial photos. You might want to have video of the entire area. And where are they supposed to put it? Well, guess what? If you're leaving and, or even instructing your users to store all of that stuff in the file section of related to any record in Salesforce, they're going to start uploading several gigabytes worth of media onto Salesforce. And you're going to hit those limits, whatever limits, depending on the, the type of uh, licensing plan that you have with Salesforce, whatever that number is, you're going to hit that number pretty quickly. The more users you have, especially when they are uploading things from that are coming from a mobile device, if it truly is just PDFs and just spreadsheets, chances are you will not really have an issue. But what is stopping a customer, a prospect from sending in an attachment that they took of a video file or a photo from their mobile phone and it's an overinflated file size and that gets magnified exponentially. So 
I'll stop rambling on that on that point because it could be a very very big issue. And then you know what do we do once we hit that limit? So to me, this is this is a concern that I have on behalf of all of the clients that I work with. Uh, Jerry, share your insights or thoughts on on this. No, I think your your point was perfect. Right with the expandable storage, it's like you know when you you get a raise on your job, right? You get a raise, and all of a sudden you're like, well, I got a raise, but it seems like I don't have any more money because your spending is going to expand, right? So it's the exact same thing with the storage. The more storage you have, it's just going to expand, like you said, with the number of users. So, you know, you want a solution, and that's what we offer it on backup that has, like, unlimited storage. So with our, uh, we have an archival solution that allows you to archive your data and allows you to archive your files. Like you said, those files, those attachments, those content documents are just as important. And so we offer unlimited storage with that. So you don't have that word, right? That's one bear, but that's eliminated. So not only can you store that, but you don't have to worry about keep going back and paying for storage and paying for storage, you know, that you have unlimited storage. And so we can basically scale with your business as you grow. Yeah. So let's actually, uh, before we dive a little bit deeper into the option that Own Backup provides, which we should definitely talk about, let's talk about for those organizations that are like, oh, no, 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 just... What, what can we do for free? What can we do that won't entail signing up for some other app? Well, first of all, you can absolutely start going through all of the records that you have in Salesforce and looking at all of those attachments and start uh, reviewing to determine whether or not you want to delete those attachments or store them somewhere else. Now, if you are going to store them somewhere else, which, by the way, is a recommendation that I give to clients as part of that initial conversation that I mentioned earlier, I'll, I tur- a lot of times they'll turn to me and say, well, David, okay, great. So what do you recommend? And I turn to them and I say, well, if you are currently using any type of cloud-based file storage system, and almost every company is, it might be Google Drive, or it might be Box, or it might be Dropbox, or it might be SharePoint. It might be something else that I've never heard of before, but usually it's one of those they're usually already paying for it. And they're usually already paying for it at a price point where the storage is either unlimited or it's pretty close to unlimited. It just doesn't matter. It is way cheaper than what what Salesforce will charge for upgrading your file storage space. So I turn to them and I say, well, you can either go through all of the files that you currently have in Salesforce and start reviewing to determine what you want to delete Or we can go ahead and start moving all of the files, which, by the way, it's free, but it is a big undertaking. It is a very big project to start looking at all of the records where you currently have files, download those files, or even if you're going to use something like Data Loader, to export all of those files. Then what you need to do is go into, let's say they're using SharePoint or Dropbox or Box, doesn't matter, go into that system. Now you need to create a corresponding folder for that that corresponds to that record, upload those files to that subfolder, and then put a link to that subfolder from that specific record in Salesforce. So, and that part is also incredibly easy to do. Uh, You can go to any contact, any account, any opportunity, or any custom object, create a custom URL, call it link to SharePoint, link to Google Drive, whatever. And it's a URL, it's just an open URL field. Once that folder or that subfolder is created in the cloud-based file storage system, you grab a copy of that URL, you paste it back into Salesforce, and now anyone can easily jump from that Salesforce record over to your cloud-based file storage solution where those files are stored. And if you think through all of the different objects and all the different records and all the different attachments that you have, what I just mentioned is very simple and free to do, but it can easily be many months of a project for someone to undertake. And once that is done, then you can go ahead and remove the file functionality, the ability to store additional files in Salesforce, you can go ahead and remove it from the page layout and start instructing everyone, here's how you access the cloud-based folder that we have dedicated to each record. So that's the free option. And David, I will yeah. I will add as well to the conversation because uh, it does come up very often. And I know media files attachments are, are, are big. 
Um, from the data side, and that's kind of what I alluded to in the beginning, um, it depends on the industry, but, but certain industries where um, you're using emails for marketing purposes. Um, oh, yeah. We see a lot of like HubSpot integrations where HubSpot loves to push, uh, you know, all the emails into Salesforce. Um, tasks is another one and cases from like a support, um, a support organization. Those, if you those have email work. to case or web to case, email to lead, web to lead, right. boom. Yeah, those three objects we <clears throat> see they explode, especially when you in, you know integrate you know new applications or you know new processes. So um, we've seen that get a little bit out of control as well, and and companies trying to mitigate that because you know, like I said, you don't you don't necessarily need an email from eight years ago. It would be nice to retain it though. Um, but why are we paying for, you know, all of that data that's been, that's, that's essentially legacy data. So you bring up, that no, you bring up an excellent point and thank you for bringing it up because it is very, very important. And I can't tell you how many times I'm in a conversation with someone where they say, I want every email that comes in or e every email that comes in and every email that goes out along with every attachment should get saved in Salesforce. And by asking for that, this is exactly what they're going to get. Now let's even forget for a minute about the media files. Let's make believe no one is ever going to be sending any kind of photos or video files for, that were taken from their mobile device and attach it to an email. Fine, I'll give you that. How about the company logo that appears in the signature of the email. We have all been there having nothing to do with Salesforce where we open an email and we see it has 30 attachments because the entire thread each time each person replied there, the company logo, which by the way, was in full resolution. It was simply shrunken to fit in the signature line, but it's actually right. two megabytes big and it kept getting saved over and over and over again to your email thread. Every single time another email comes and goes, not only is that same image getting saved over and over again, so it's getting saved maybe 15 times from the most recent email, but it also got saved an additional 14 times from the email before that, 13 times for the email before that. So just the logo that appears in the signature line could blow up your entire file storage capacity that Salesforce gives you. It's a big problem. So Ezra, thank you for bringing that up. And Kim is agreeing with us in the comments that she hates the logos. <laughs> it makes me crazy. <laughs> it totally makes me crazy. Uh, but anyway, Jerry, anything else you want to add to the topic? No, no, that's, uh, I mean, that's all great points. And it's like you said, you don't, you know, when you think about exactly, uh, Ezra brought up the example of cases, right? These things just like proliferate, right? You know, you send an email, but then you generate that email correspondence. And once you email that, you know, generate that correspondence, you know, those emails start to just exponentially increase along with the task. And then, like you said, those infamous logos as well, right? All that stuff just, you know, you think it multiplies, but it's actually exponential. And so you just run up on your storage limits really quickly. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the solution that Own Backup has that can address this. And uh, I'll let you guys take it away, either Ezra or Jerry. How? Just explain, because we're, we're not doing a, a screen share on it, but conceptually, how would it work exactly? So let's say I am the, uh, the Salesforce leader within the organization and I'm coming to you and I'm saying, oh my gosh, we are drowning in file storage, our file, file storage capacity, we're over the limit, Salesforce wants to charge us and I, we don't have the time or resources, we don't have the bandwidth to start evaluating, reviewing all of the different attachments that are saved to every different kind of record, every different type of object, we, but we do need to somehow a, offload it from Salesforce to free up the space, while at the same time, we do absolutely need to make those files easily accessible to our users. So what does Own Backup have in order to address that? Yeah, so this is what our, you know, what our executive team, what our product team heard from, from Salesforce, um, you know, administrators and you know own backup has been known for years in the backup space um so it's pretty exciting when we launch something new this is n no longer new 
Um, but what we built was um, a managed package that sits inside your environment, as opposed to the own backup everyone knows and loves, which is external to Salesforce. Um, and it allows you know administrators to create automated retention policies so they can say exactly what objects they want to tackle um, you know, with specific logic. So let's give an example of, you know, emails older than five years and you create that policy, you create all the, you know, specifics around it of, of, you know, how many emails you want to archive. Um, but we will automatically on whatever recurring basis you choose, go in and delete that, those, those records from Salesforce. Uh, store it on our servers and we have unlimited storage. So we offer unlimited storage from our end. And the best part is that because it's a managed package, we display those records, assuming you want your end users to still see those records associated with the parent accounts. Um, so let's say it's an email attached to a contact. Um, you'll have another component, uh, let's say in Lightning, where you can see archived data or archived emails and your end users who had access to it previously can still see whatever they need to see within the environment, within the UI. Um, so you're cleaning up your data storage. Um, you're also optimizing your, your processes in your environment. So right, if you, if you remove all these emails or files or whatnot, think pr all your processes, your flows, automations, everything's gonna run a little bit faster. Um, but the big, the big one for everyone is that, is that visibility, right? So it's, it's automated and you have full, full control over the visibility of those records and you can always unarchive them if you ever need to. Nice. I love it. Jerry, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, we'll, I'll show you all that in the show me section, which I think is coming up next, but yeah. So, you know, I think that what the great part is, you know, you're, you're offloading these documents and these records, right? And so they're, you know, you're not paying for the Salesforce storage space, but you can still access them inside of your Salesforce org, you know, along with your live data. So I think that is so important. So, you know, like Ezra mentioned that email from eight years ago, so it's there. If you need to access it, you can access it right from the Salesforce org. You don't have to go to that other cloud solution but it's offloaded. So it's not taking up that Salesforce storage space. So I think that's just a key, you know, feature. Yep. So what I'm hearing is that to the end user, it is somewhat of a seamless integration where their experience is not like they have to jump from one system to another. The list of files are easily accessible to them on the corresponding contact or account or opportunity or custom object uh, that the file was associated with in the first place. Right? Exactly. Love exactly. It. That's it, David. Awesome. All right. We are at the time mark right now. We're going to switch over to the show me section. So Jerry's going to show us a little bit about the archiving functionality. And we're going to also talk about some of the backup features that come out of the box with Salesforce and what backup looks like for organizations that are actually using own backup. So bear with me one second. All right. So we're now on Jerry's screen. Jerry, take it away. All right, yeah, so this is the archiver package. Um, so this right here first is a cool archiver dashboard. I actually get into this in a second, but we have some basically, you know, like a bird's eye view of your storage in your environment, and we can actually break that down by object as well. Um, so I'll get to that in a second, but I think the coolest thing to show first, David, is the user experience. So we talked about how this is like a seamless experience of seeing your, you know, live data along with your archive data. So just wanna walk through a couple examples of that. So. You know, I'm gonna go to an account, David, and let's say I'm looking for this case, you know, under this account. So I go to this 3M company account, and then, you know, we're all familiar with these, uh, you know, related lists here. So I'm gonna go and look for this case, and I'm looking for case 13276, right? And so I can obviously see from this list, it's not there, right? So case is not there, you know, maybe it's archived. So to be able to see those archived data, I'm gonna go back into this account. And then what you get with this managed package is this widget. So I have here this archive widget. So I'm gonna select that. And then here, the cool thing is everything associated with this account that's been archived, I can see here, David. So you can see here, this account L1, this is actually a custom object I created. Mm -hmm. It's related to the account through a master detail relationship, right? So that link is there. Uh, in cases, contacts, anything else that's related to this account that's been archived, I can go here and search for it. 
So if I go here and select case, you know, I'm looking for that case 13276. And then here I get that list of cases. So these are all the cases for this account that have been archived, right? So you're not able to access the related list, but they are here in this uh, list here. So I can scroll through here if I need to and find this case, but you also give you search capability as well. So I can go in and I can search for that uh, specific case, which is that 13276. If I can actually type, right? <laughs> and then I can hit the search and then I'll search for that case. And then now I can see that archived case. So now, like I said, so we're in Salesforce, right? This case has been archived. It is not in our environment, but I can see that case here. And then I can go here and look at the details of that case. So if I go in here and click view, I can see everything associated with this case. And then the cool thing here, David, is I'm looking at this case as if it was a live case. So this page layout that you're looking at, this is the page layout of the corresponding case if it was live in your environment, right? So it's not like we're just putting, you know, just like a spreadsheet of data here. This is how that case looks in its page layout form as if it was live. So I think that's a really, you know, important feature as well. So, you know, when a user looks at this, they don't have to say like, oh, you know, this case doesn't look familiar. You know, it looks just like any other case that was live in their environment, right? You know, I have my, all my sections in the same place. Everything's here. Um, also, you can see your related data, right? So not just those cases, but when we talked about earlier, right, with me, you and Ezra, we had that discussion, like, what about the emails? Mm -hmm. What about those related tasks? So if I click on this related link here, I get all that. So here I can see some assets that were related to this case. I can look at that data. These are also archived. And again, these assets are in that same page layout. And I just want to stress, right, like this asset is not in the environment either, right? This asset record has been archived. It is out of your Salesforce org, but I'm in my Salesforce org and I'm looking at it in its form that it would be in if it was live. So pretty cool, cool here. And then I see all the other associated records, right? So here's case feed records. Here's case history, case shares. And then here are those infamous emails, right? So I got all the email messages here that I need to look at, that I need to refer to if I need to. I have tasks. And then your favorite, David, I have content documents down here as well, right? So any content documents related to this case is here. And I can download those uh, documents if I need to re uh, review those, David, or I can actually preview it. So I can click this preview button. It's actually going to open a new window, and then it's going to actually give me a preview to that content document or that attachment. So you can see like, hey, here's the document here. I don't need to go through and download it and all that stuff. And here's like a little plug for uh, our Salesforce Shield product as well. But why would someone that archive that file? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Kidding. Well, I'm know. kidding. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, I had to put that dig in there for you, David. But yeah, but, but how cool is that, though? How cool is that, right? So I'm looking at this document. This document is archived. It's off the platform. I don't even need to download or anything. I can go look at it here. You know, maybe I just wanted to look at some data in this document. Right. I could just look from here and never leave the sales source of work. This is All right. Great. So that's the so that's that's pretty powerful as well. Now we also have a um, you know great search capabilities as well. So you know, say we have another case that we're looking for uh, twelve three hundred six, right? And we don't know David whether this case is archived or not, right? So a user's coming in, they know about the archive, they're just looking for this case. They don't know whether it's archived or not. They want to pull it up, so they go to their Salesforce global search, right? And so when they go to this global search, obviously this case is archived. It's not there. So like, hey, can't you know? I can't find this case. But they're like, oh, you know, maybe this case is archived. And so what we give to them is a global search. So we have a archive of global search as well that are just focused on searching for those records that are archived. So I can come in here and, you know, I can refine this search. So I can go in here and find no specifically what I'm looking for. You know, so if I'm looking for a case, I can go mm -hmm. in here and select the case object. But I can leave this as all, you know, say I'm not really sure. So I can go in here and put in that case number. You can also add a date range here as well, right? So, you know, we can archive data. We can go back as far as you need to. So say, you know, specifically this was archived, you know, three years ago. So you can go back here and say, I want to search from, you know, January 1st of 2018 to December 31st of 2018 if you want. Again, you know, giving you options here, filters to help you hone down on that search, you know, maybe make it run a little faster, more efficient. But I'll just leave that the way it is. And then, so I want to search for this case. I just literally just put in that case number. And it could be a case description, you know, what have you. And then that pops up in here. So instead of using that where I couldn't find it in the Salesforce search, now I have it in my archive of global search. And then same options, right? So from here, you know, I can unarchive, I can export that record, I can view that record. And then again, when I view that record, it's going to be in, you know, the exact page format. All right. And then like we do have those options. So you can't export this record. If you want to export this record outside the environment for whatever reason, we'll export it as a CSV file. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do that with your will, David. And you can unarchive it, right? 
So we can take this record data, we can unarchive it. And what that does is that puts it back into your live Salesforce org. So you know we're on that account, you know we're on that related list, and then you unarchive this record, it'll show back up in that related list just like it was never archived. So that that's a powerful function as well to unarchive the functionality. Very very right. cool. So that's the yeah yeah. So that is the user experience. So next thing is how do we how does this set up right? How do we set this stuff up so that these data is archived and we can see it and all that good stuff? And so that comes from the policies. Um, before I go to policies, I'll go back to this home page, this dashboard that we were on in the beginning. So just to talk about this a little bit, we'll give you a couple of helpful graphs here. So this first one is my Salesforce storage. So what this is going to tell you, David, is like, hey, here's all the data storage in your org, even available data. And so you can mask that available data out. And then now, based on each one of your objects, here's what, you know, how much capacity they're taking up in your org, right? So this is a great way for a user to tell, like, hey, I have a lot of case data in here. Maybe my case object is a candidate for me to create a policy to create, you know, and archive some of that case data. So this is what kind of information you get from this graph. And then these next two graphs are kind of bird's eye views here. Uh, one is of your Salesforce storage. So again, same type of detail, but this is at a higher level, right? So this is saying, hey, your storage in general, you have this much storage space or capacity. This is how much you're using. That's shown in dark blue. And then this is how much you have available, right? And so as, as you start to use data, this blue line starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? And then we also capture the files as well. So like you said, not only have you to worry about your data, but you need to worry about your file storage as well. So we're all, work, you know, we're tracking that for you as well. We'll show you where you stand from a file standpoint. And then as you start to archive your data, we can start to take advantage of this archiver storage graph here, right? And so now once you archive that data, we'll show you here how much data you're archiving. And again, hopefully, you know, that'll start moving up. And right. this is what's on our, you know, being backed up on our platform. And same thing with the files as well, right? So once you start backing up and archiving your files, then that'll be shown here. And then that graph will reflect that as well. Okay, so very helpful dashboard here, you know, to kind of help you, number one, decide what kind of things you need to archive. And then once you do, David, what does it look like? Like, what does your, you know, your storage look like holistically now from a Salesforce storage standpoint and from an archiver standpoint? All right. This so is great. One, Go ahead, David. Yep. No, I was yep. just saying this is great. Thank you. All right, good. So uh, again, I want to go through the policies now. So I'm going to show you a policy. So everything we do is driven by policies. So what you want to do is, you know, I've looked at these cases, right? And I want to create a policy for these cases to be able to archive those. So I'm going to show you a policy here. I created, you know, for that account for cases here. And so here I have that I want to archive these cases. Um, you can select the object here, so I select case, but this works for any custom or standard object. And you can also select documents is here, right, David? So if you want to just do the documents and you don't want to do the actual, you know, data records related to the documents, you can just go in here and do the content documents or the attachments. That is a valid, you know, object that we can do a policy around as well, okay? And then you can set a schedule here. So right here, I'm going to uh, archive these cases on the first of every month at 2 a.m. So the other good thing about this when you create these policies, is these policies run on their own once you set it. So I can set this, I'm gonna set this case criteria and then this policy is gonna run once a month and I don't have to worry about it, David. They can just set it and forget it. So I don't have to physically go in here once a month or once a week or whatever to archive this data. These policies, once I set it up, is gonna run on its own. So this is all fully automated, hands off for you to be able to archive your data. All right, and so here we can select the filter criteria here we can do this, you know, declaratively. So you can see here, we can select these fields, very, you know, user-friendly. You can also do it manually as well. So if, you know, have some, you know, comp uh, sophisticated admins and developers out there, right? They want to write their own SQL query. You know, you can have that. And you can come here and put in any criteria that you want. So that is available to you as well. And then I have a simple filter here, you know, say, hey, all conditions here are met. I want 10 records. This could be a thousand, this could be 10,000, this could be a million. You can set this in whatever you want. And then I'm just gonna do by a close date here. So I'm gonna say, hey, any closed uh, cases that are closed for older than a year. So I'm gonna select that criteria here, older than 365 days, I wanna archive. And then you can see that being reflected in this cycle query here. All right. And then I have an option here for content documents and archiving those, right? So you can choose to select, do you want to archive those related documents? So we had that, content, that discussion, uh, David, about those pictures and those other documents. So we can down, we can archive those automatically with these records here by selecting this box. So not only will we archive these cases, but we'll archive the documents associated with those cases. 
all right? And then here we select a fields configuration. So if you remember on that user experience, you know, we were searching for those cases. So we had that big list of cases. I put in that case number. Where, so there were fields there to kind of help you identify those cases. That is customizable as well. So basically we can take any customer standard field in that object and we can put that here and display it. Uh, I think we can go up to eight fields and then display that data for you to help you identify, you know, those cases that are archived. All right. Nice. And then we have more, some more advanced features here. So, you know, by default, any uh, object that has a master detail relationship with the case will be archived, right? So you don't have to worry about it. So if you, you know, have this relationship that's going to be archived with it, but you also have these child objects. And so you can also add those as well, right? So if you have these child objects that have like a lookup and you want to archive those as well. So, you know, we're not going to do that by default, but we give you that flexibility here to come in here and say, hey, I have this object, here's a reference field here. And when I archive these cases, I also wanna archive these objects as well. So we give you that, you know, that's pretty powerful functionality and we allow you to set the retention period for this policy. So here I'm setting this at three years. So what this means is I'm gonna keep these cases, once they're archived, they're gonna be kept for three years. And then after that, they'll be purged out of the archive. Now this can be set from anywhere from one month to 99 years. So basically unlimited retention. So like I said, we can, we have unlimited retention. You can customize that if you need to, you know, maybe you a financial firm that has a set retention, maybe it's seven years, 10 years or five years, you know, you can set that right here in the policy. All right. And then once you have all of that good stuff set up here, you can actually generate a preview. So when I click this preview, it's gonna show me, hey, here's a, a sample of the records here, just to make sure my criteria is good and I'm on the right track, right? So here's the case numbers here. I can see the closed dates are old, so this looks good. You know, maybe if I saw some newer cases in here, I will go up here and I can change my criteria and make sure I'm getting the exact you no know, cases I want here. So that's a powerful feature as well to be able to preview that. And then you can just save it. And so then once you save it, like I said, that program runs, um, it'll run on that interval and then you can, uh, you know, kick that off and you set it and forget it. And then we also have a run now feature as well. So once this policy is saved, you can actually, if you didn't want to wait for that date, you actually want to kick it off. You can actually click that run now button and it would actually start, you know, running that archive job right away. So you can go ahead and archive those cases. And then the next month you will just pick up the remainder, you know, based on your data usage and things like that. All right, so that is the tool. So any any questions for you, David? Does that make sense? Yep, that makes a lot of sense for me. Uh, thank you. This is this is really great. This is really powerful stuff. And as Guillerme is saying yeah. in the comments, easy. That summarizes yes. it. It's easy. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, you know, just try to make it seamless. So when you you know you're looking at the, when you're looking at this data here, you know, you don't have to worry about whether it's archived or not. You'll be able to see that you know again within the application. And then we make those setting those policies easy as well, right? So you'll be able to you know go in and set whatever criteria you need to to be able to archive cases, and you can just kind of set and forget it. Those policies will run automatically for you. Very cool. All right. So let's also talk about backing up your Salesforce data. Different from archiving. Conceptually, right. it's similar, but uh, backing up. So a lot of organizations assume, a lot of companies that are using Salesforce assume somewhere magically that there's a backup. Salesforce is taking care of it, that there's a backup somewhere. And usually what happens is most of the time, it's either one of two scenarios that I've seen. A user either accidentally or maliciously deletes a whole bunch of, or bulk updates incorrectly, a whole bunch of data. And then they say, oh my gosh, I know that it was good as of Tuesday. We only discovered that at some point on Tuesday, one of our users did X, Y, and Z. And now our data is all messed up. Is there any way to go back to what there was as of Tuesday? So do you want to talk a little bit about what options Salesforce has out of the box? You want me to cover it? Like I, I, I can totally cover it if you want me to. I mean, I, I can yeah, uh, tackle it a little bit, um, and, and it is something where archiving and backups tend to be synonymous sometimes. And so we really, on our end, try and, and separate the two. They're very different purposes, right? The goal of archiving is around data storage optimization and performance and compliance and, and all of that. 
um, whereas backups is really around data security. Um, so with regards to like protecting your environment, when you sign the contract with Salesforce, you're entering this shared data responsibility with them where, you know, they're responsible and, and they're world-class best in the world CRM at protecting your data from like the infrastructure side. Um, but you're obviously responsible for what you do with your own data. And so having a daily backup of your data and your metadata is crucial. And, um, you know, we've surveyed, we've done a lot of surveys, a lot of white papers, a lot of talking to people at Dreamforce at, at all the different events. And, you know, the, the common thread is that, is that most people are not doing anything. If people are doing something, they're using the weekly CSV export uh, that Salesforce offers. Um, and so for those who, who aren't aware of the CSV export, uh, you can go in on a manual, you know, manually on a weekly basis and download a, a, a zip of all of your, of all of your data. Um, which I'll, I'll, love, I'll describe in a little bit more detail, like what that's all about, <laughs> because I've lived through having to, I mean, it's easy when you're, you know, initially setting it up, the, the, you're pulling your hair out when you're trying to make use of it. So for those who are not familiar with it, uh, you basically, you go into setup and actually, Jerry, since you're sharing your screen, can you just go ahead, uh, go ahead and click on the gear icon into setup and go into the backup. Yeah. Uh, just to show the native out of the box features. And basically right. what Salesforce allows you to do is to set up a weekly export of, um, it, you could choose specific objects or you can choose absolutely everything. And when you do, there we go, data export. And over here is where you can choose, uh, yeah, go ahead and a schedule. Yeah. Okay, so it's really, it's on this screen where, I mean, this is really where the, the heart of it is. Uh, so most people, you just uh, leave that initial checkbox populated, which will select absolutely everything. And by the top of the screen, that screen that's where you set up with uh, what, uh, what is the schedule that you would like to implement. And when this happens, usually people don't do anything else after that. They go ahead and they set it up and the admin will get an email notification based on the schedule of whatever is set up over here. We'll get an email notification uh, about a backup and usually they don't even open the email. But if you do open the email, your backup is pretty much gone. Uh, so it, it expires. So if let's say one day you wake up and you realize that you needed the backup of two or three months ago, um, that backup is probably not available anymore because the links expire. Those zip files that you would be able to download if you did click on those emails, click on the links in those emails, um, are gone. Salesforce is not saving them anymore. So when you get the emails, you then need to go ahead and open up the email and click on it. And when you click on the, the link in the email, it will show you depending on the size of your database, depending on the number of objects that you have and the number of uh, records that you have, you might need to download not one, but many different zip files. So it will take you to a landing page back in Salesforce where you will see all of the different zip files that you need to download. Sometimes it can easily be 50 zip files. When you download those zip files, you then need to store them somewhere so you know this is the export from this date and time. And then next week when you get the email, you know, you need to go ahead and do the same thing all over again. Well, what happens when the senior leader within the organization turns to you and says, okay, last Tuesday, someone accidentally or maliciously screwed up a bunch of our data and we need to leverage the backup from that point in time. So first of all, you will only have the most granular backup you will have is weekly. Let's make believe for a moment that you actually have a backup either of that, that particular day or of the day prior. So that's the most granular you're going to get for, uh, for the backup. You need to find where did you store all of those zip files. And remember I mentioned before it could easily be 50 zip files. Well, when you actually open the zip file, you will then see 15, 20, 50 CSV files within each zip file. Because if, let's say, for example, you have 20,000, 100,000, 400,000 accounts or contacts or leads, 
It's not all contained in one CSV file. There are many different CSV files that are broken up among all of those di different zip files that you then need to reconstruct all of the data. So if your eyes aren't bugging out and you're not ready to pull your hair out at this point, just imagine taking all of those CSV files and reconstructing them. You have to take, let's say it's contacts, you have to take the contact and then the created by, the last modified by, the related records related to the contact, the tasks, the activities, the opportunities, the cases, all of those are in separate CSV files sitting somewhere within those zip files that you just downloaded. So it is a major headache to try to even, even if you have, if you've downloaded all of those zip files on a weekly basis, to try to make use of those files to restore the system is a tremendous undertaking. It can easily take days, if not weeks, just to reconstruct the system. With that, I'll be quiet and I'll let Ezra and Jerry elaborate a little bit more. Guillermo is like, I just got tired of listening yeah. to you. <laughs> No, I'll let Jerry, Jerry's the former admin here. So I can, I can, I mean, you should share your experience with it. I can just say, right. It's new record IDs also when you export it, because they don't reuse the same record IDs. So you have that also to, to deal with. Um, and then there's no metadata. So, you know, to protect, you know, if there was a change in, in a permission set or a report or a validation or rule, a list view, validation rule, none of that's included in the export period. So, um, you know, the data is important. The metadata is also important. The files and attachments also, right? You want to make sure everything is protected. If you knew where the data loss or the data corruption would happen, then you would just, you would just back up that piece. So um, that's the name of the game on our end is to, is to really capture everything sitting on force.com. Um, so that in the event of something going wrong, uh, you can identify what happened and be able to pull, uh, you know, down to the most granular level, um, pull that back in. So Jerry, if you want to share your experience from, from an admin perspective. No, yeah, I've unfortunately had to do this a couple of times and the process is excruciating. So, you know, like you said, I mean, it's, it's basically a project, David. So you got to plan. I mean, you basically have to plan because the, the important thing is you need to know your schema. So, you know, you're not going to get those relationships in those files, right? It's like you said, it's a CSV file of contacts and it's CSV files of accounts. Well, there's nothing linking those together. So you kind of need to know your schema. And then you kind of need to plan if you're using a tool like data loader or workbench you kind of need to plan everything out right because you can't just load in say opportunities because they you know are they have parents of accounts so you have to load in the accounts first now when you load in the accounts first there's new ids like ezra mentioned so now you have to take that those uh accounts with the new ids and then you have to merge those with the like you no know, opportunities right and so you have to head create this field, maybe like a, a legacy field to store the old account ID and then be able to match it to the file once you have the new IDs so that you can match those IDs together and then, you know, marry it to the new. I mean, it's very complicated. So that creates those relationships and you literally have to do that for every single child object. So, you know, if you have accounts and then you have, you know, eight objects as child's underneath, you know, this is like, you know, nine different runs of your data. So it's very complicated and convoluted. Super painful is how I would summarize yes. it. And uh, no executive, no Salesforce leader within an organization has any clue of what's involved prior to that moment in time when you're scrambling to just, you want to just press a button somewhere to activate the restore button <laughs> to you know to to just get back whatever it was from a particular date and time and it is anything but easy it's really really complicated i'm sorry tim tim says we just made his head explode so this is painful <laughs> okay uh it, re relieve them from some pain share share with them what what it's like uh, for organizations that are using own backup. And by the way, um, one of my clients recently had an issue. Uh, one of my clients who is using own backup recently had an issue where they needed 
they actually asked me to do a bulk data update where they later realized, oh yeah, we didn't want you to update all of the records just like we said, only a segment of the records. Is it possible for you to restore just those opportunities that met the certain criteria to restore them to what they were last Tuesday. So um, I was able to sit in the seat of the customer to actually benefit from the magic that Own Backup provides in this type of use case, which is why I'm so excited about it. Yeah, so sure. And so this is um, this is the Own Backup application here. And the first thing you see is our multi-org dashboard. And so this basically gives you a single pane of glass to manage all the backups in your org. And so you can see here, I have my production data, you know, of course that's super important, but I also have my production metadata, you know, so as Ezra mentioned, you know, with these weekly exports, you don't get any metadata backup whatsoever. So we have that as well. And then I also have my sandboxes here. So I have a full copy, I have a partial copy, I have a dev sandbox. Um, so with own backup, we offer unlimited storage and you can add an unlimited amount of orgs as well. So again, we can scale with your business, you know, so as you grow and as your data needs increase, we can meet that as well. And then as you add different developer environments, you know, you're doing projects and projects, you know, we can add those developer boxes as well and back all those stuff up. So that's another thing that remember as well, like it's not just important just to back up your production data, but you also in these full copy sandboxes and developer sandboxes, right? And you're developing, you're adding fields and you're adding flows and then maybe you're deploying them to different environments. So those uh, sandboxes are important to be able to be backed up as well. And so we have you covered there. All right, so let's, let's walk through a, a quick scenario here, you know, a data loss scenario. So I'm gonna go into my production data environment. And then let's say, you know, someone came to you, let's say a client came to you, David, and said, hey, you know, we had a mass um, account loss. You know, we need to be able to identify that and be able to, to restore from it, right? So you have them set up and on backup. And so what we have here first is this visual graph. And so this is a great way to see changes in your data, you know, for each one of your objects. So I have accounts here, but you can look at any custom or standard object and you know see these type of data changes for each one of those objects. And then we can look over here for any time frame. So by default, we can see the last seven days, uh, the last month or two. You can actually come in here and set your own range. So if you know it was you know maybe three to six months ago, you can set that range if you want. Or you can come in here and look at literally all the backups since you first set up the service here. And so you can see everything here that was added that's here in the green. Anytime accounts were added, uh, anytime accounts were changed, you can see those in the gray lines and then anytime accounts were removed. OK, so we have this uh, account loss. You know, we want to see when that happened. And we also want to see the magnitude too, Dave, right? So we want to know, hey, when did this last data loss occur and, you know, how big is the damage, right? So what are we looking at here? So I'm going to go back just the last 30 days. I'm going to focus in on just what was removed. And I can see here that I had 84 accounts that were deleted on November the 5th. So it gives me a lot of knowledge, right? When did this last data loss occur? It actually occurred almost a month ago on the 5th. And then what are we looking at, right? We lost 84 accounts, you know, not as opposed to 840 or 84,000, just gives you kind of like peace of mind, like, hey, here's where the data loss is contained, okay? And then from here, we can drill down into the snapshot and get a little bit more information. And so here in this backup, now I'm looking at the entire backup for November 5th. And I can see these 84 accounts here that are deleted. And I can do some other cool things, like I can click on this negative 84, and that'll actually allow me to download a CSV file, but not like you know a zip file of everything like you get with the weekly export, but just those 84 files that were deleted. So that's super handy. I can, you could take that file, David, you could share that with the user and say, hey, here are the 84 accounts that we found that were deleted. You know, Are these the ones that you're looking for? And they can validate that and go, yeah, this is it. This is what we wanted. Let's restore these, okay? And then from there, you can just click this restore job button, and then we can kick off a restore job right from here to start restoring those 84 accounts. So when I click, click that restore job button, we actually start this job up, and then we're not only gonna bring back those 84 accounts to restore, but we're actually gonna go through your entire schema. So we talked about that problem earlier of having to do this one by one, and if you had child objects kind of planning it out, well, with only backup, you don't have to do any of that. So we do that for you. So we go through your schema, and any other child object records that are related to the account that were deleted, we'll bring those back so you can restore those as well. So when that job is run, it looks like this. And so we can see here that, hey, we have these 84 account records that need to be restored, but we have a whole bunch of other records here as well, right? So everything related to the account that had records deleted, we found that for you. So I actually have a custom object here, account L1, that had records deleted. I can see that here. And you can start to see the hierarchy here. So I can see this account L2 object that had records deleted as well. So that's a child of the account L1 record, and it's a grandchild of the account. 
but I can see that right here in this preview screen. And basically you can see everything else that was related to the accounts, right? So I can see cases with the associated records that were deleted, uh, contacts, opportunities, and so on and so forth. So basically everything that has a massive detail relationship with that account and that had records deleted as, you know, like a cascade delete when you deleted those account records, we'll bring that here for you to restore. Now I also wanna point your attention to this orphan in parentheses. So these object records are actually lookups, right? So they don't have a master detail relationship with the account. They have a lookup relationship, but we pull those for you as well. So you can see here that they are orphaned. They will be reassociated because if you think about it, these records aren't actually deleted from your Salesforce environment, right? They're still there. They're just orphaned. So they no longer have that uh, relationship to that opportunity or other account or other parent record. So we're actually going to restore those lookup relationships. And then David, I know you're always concerned about documents. So we actually restore those content documents, those attachments. <laughs> and for those content documents, we actually restore those links too as well, right? So, you know, if you delete this record, you bring that record back, that's fine, right? But if it's associated with content documents in your file storage system, you want that link to be restored as well. So own backup will also handle that for you. Okay, so holistically, we can basically put this, uh, your org back to the point where before these 84 accounts were deleted. Now we give you some other options as well. So. You know, let's say you don't want to restore some of these objects. So you have that option as well. Let's say you don't want to restore any of these case records with the associated child object info. You can just deselect that. And so now that's excluded from the data set that'll be restored. So it's just that simple to do that. And you can actually filter on these actual object records as well. So let's say, you know, that user came back to you, David, and said, hey, you show me that CSV file of those 84 account records. I don't need to restore all those. I only actually need to restore a subset where you can easily handle that here. You can just download that CSV file again of those 84 records and say there were 10 that you didn't need to restore. You just delete those from that file and then you can upload a new version of that file here and then we'll only restore those records that you specify in that file. And we'll allow you to do SQL where clauses as well. So if you want to restrict those accounts by a record type, um, by account type or whatever your criteria is, you can actually filter those records by there as well. And so basically you, we allow you to get great granular here and select the exact records you need to restore. And then once you've done that, you just click the start restore button and then we'll start restoring these account records and the associated child records that you specify back into your Salesforce org. So that's the, that's the process, David. It's pretty simple, um, but pretty powerful as well. Love it. This is very cool stuff. And uh, there were a couple of comments uh, that came in while you were showing that. Tim raised, hang on one second, let me just uh, pull this up on the screen. Oh, there we go. Um, Tim mentioned, I also like the fact that uh, if a backup sees a bunch of items, records deleted or changed, own backup will notify you via email. So, I mean, you showed right. it, Jerry. And I'll tell you, being the admin who's on the receiving end of some of these notifications, in a way, it's very comforting. Like, at first, it's like, what? Who did what? 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 <laughs> but then when you're looking at it, like, oh, yeah, uh, it's like someone did a bulk update, let's say, for that impacted a bunch of contacts. They were actually co bulk correcting the records in the system, or we just implemented a process builder or roll-up helper that recalculated and re-updated a whole bunch of different records in the system. It's expected. So just having that confirmation is, I think, comforting as an, as an admin. Yeah, for sure. And that's our smart alert functionality. And that's very flexible as well. So I'm here in the smart alerts and basically for any object and that's any custom or standard object, you can basically set this alert and you can set, you know, you can specify your own criteria. So if you want to know, for example, anytime uh, any account record was deleted. So basically I can go here, I can select this object. And what this query alert is saying is, hey, when any, when more than zero records of an account has been removed, you know, send me an email notification. And so when the next backup runs, it sees that those, you know, oh, I already had, looks like I already had that one created down here. And so basically the way that works is, you know, when the next backup runs, you know, I had those 84 accounts were deleted. Once that backup runs, it sees that, it'll shoot off an email. It says, hey, you got a smart alert on accounts, 84 accounts were deleted. And it's cool in the email, David, it'll give you a link into own backup. So you click that link in the email and it'll actually open up a browser window and bring you into own backup. Yeah, great stuff. 
All right. We, I want to be mindful of the time. Uh, we do have one question that came in so far. Let's switch over into the Q&A. So bear with me one second. All right. So Guillerme's got a question over here. And let me throw it on the bottom so that we can actually read it over here. I've got a lot of CPQ projects, and the most complicated thing is the backup and deployment. Does own backup work for these purposes? And he also put a follow up. Uh, he's talking about the data, metadata, and the hierarchy. Yeah, it's, it's a great yep. question. Um, uh, Jerry, you can, you can back me up here, I think. Um, we get, we get this question all the time. CPQ is one, but there's a lot of data projects. Um, so own backup is, is you want that you want own backup in place as part of these data projects, because the ability to do an on-demand snapshot before and after, um, is, is huge. Cause then you can compare exactly, see what changed on the data and the metadata side and be able to roll back if you, if anything broke. So it's kind of like fail fast, fix fast. Um, and, and, you know, get the project uh, done. That being said, um, own backup is not a deployment tool. So we work with great partners like Capado, um, which specializes more on the deployment side, you know, of, of, of the, you know, the metadata piece. Um, we do have um, data seeding. So it, we call it sandbox seeding, um, where you could see data from production to a sandbox or from a sandbox to a sandbox. But when you're getting into the territory around deploying data from from sandbox to production, um, it's definitely not what our tool is designed for. And then someone some, someone like Capado would be a great a great partner there. Nice. Yeah, and I'll just add that for yeah, and I'll just add for CPQ. You know, we you know we handle you know that, and we handle other managed packages as well. So we you know, and I showed in that example where we had custom objects. You know, I had some objects for managed packages in that demo, so it works for that as well. And then, as Ezra mentioned with the sandbox seeding, that's really good for CPQ because, as you know, with CPQ, you actually have some data that, you know, serves as metadata. And so our sandbox seeding tool, you know, we actually have a lot of customers that use that for CPQ because we can actually see the data using that tool, and that serves as getting your metadata over as well. Beautiful. And I don't see any other questions that are coming in. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time because we are a little bit over the top of the hour. So we're going to wrap it up. Ezra and Jerry, thank you so much for sharing some of the magic that you guys have at Own Backup. And I think this is... Uh, being the person who plays the role as consultant slash admin for many organizations, I definitely see the value in a lot of these solutions for a lot of use cases that are very realistic and come up all the time. So thank you both. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, yeah, for, thanks having so much for having us. You bet. See you later. And for all of you, thank you for joining us. And I'll see you next week.